Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Richmond, Virginia. My name is Charlie Dupree, and I'm the rector of St. Paul's, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2021 Lenten Speaker Series. Before we move into our program, I would uh, really love for you to join me in just a brief moment of prayer, whatever prayer means for you. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of love, the gift of beauty, and the gift of community. We come before you in a season of pandemic, a season of so many kinds of journey. And now we lift up those who are sick and suffering. We lift up those who have died, we lift up those who mourn, and we lift up those who attend to the sick. Fill them with your light and your wisdom and your patience, and bring us all to a place of health and wholeness. In the name of love, we pray these things. Amen. So typically we would be all together gathered in this beautiful space, this beautiful sanctuary, and we would have had a time of worship. We'd have eaten or would be preparing to eat a delicious lunch prepared by faithful members of St. Paul's and by Episcopalians across the city of Richmond. Clearly this year is different. And when the design team came together to put together the list of speakers for the series, we immediately decided that we should invite artists. We also quickly decided to focus on the theme of the journey. Not only is the theme of journey big in the Bible, the idea of journey has been a major part of our lives in this last year. And who better to help us name and describe and give voice to the meaning of journeys than artists. So in this series, you will hear the journeys of different artists, poets, authors, visual artists. They will talk about their journeys and our hope is that in their journey, you will see your journey. And in hearing their journey, you will see the commonality and the connectedness of all of our journeys, the human journey. Dave Coogan is here. Dave will be with us at each of the events and he and his family are faithful members of St. Paul's. Dave is also a teacher and an author and he is a person dedicated to helping others find their own voice through writing. His journeys take him into the lives of incarcerated persons, into the jail systems, and into the lives of those we may never encounter. Dave will be our guide and conversation partner as we take this journey with our speakers. Now, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the Q and the A, the Q and A. <laughs> Please put them in the Q&A and we'll see what we can do to work them into the conversation. So again, thank you all for being here. I'm excited about what is ahead. Let the journey begin. Dave. All right, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, hey, everybody, we are excited tonight to have with us Tanya Olson. Uh, Tanya is the author of two poetry collections, Stay in 2019 and Boyishly, in, in 2013, both from Yes, Yes books. Um, her poetry, let's see, one of these received the 2014 American Book Award. That must have been the 2013 collection, right? <laughs> uh, okay, her poem, 54 Prints, was chosen for inclusion in Best American Poems 2015. She was named a 2011 Lambda Fellow by the Lambda Literary Foundation and won a Discovery Boston Review Prize in 2010. Tanya Olson lives in Silver Spring, Maryland, and is a senior lecturer in English at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Welcome, Tanya. 
Welcome to our little corner of the internet. Well, Glad thank you. <laughs> Glad to have you here. Um, so as, as Charlie uh, mentioned in his introduction, we are in the season of Lent and Lent is a time of searching. And it's something that we do um, in many different ways. And um, I know that you as an artist are no stranger to this process of searching, searching for insight, for community, um, uh, for, for life affirming experiences. Um, and I know that's really tough to do in the midst of this pandemic, but I know you've also been at it a while, even before the pandemic. So um, can I ask you to begin there and just explain a little bit about your calling to poetry, what you were searching for and how you took up this journey? What sort of questions and problems were you interested in? Yeah, well, I want to thank you all for um, having me. I'm always really excited to come to sort of non-traditional um, uh, spaces uh, to share poetry, because I think a lot of times poetry has sort of um, become siloed in the university, and that does, you know, uh, poetry or poets or uh, anybody else um, a lot of good. And my journey to being a poet uh, was a kind of non-traditional one. And uh, I think that's what we need more of, is sort of more models of uh, non-traditional uh, uh, poets, non-traditional poetry. So I, um, I think as an undergraduate, I think the, the way that we sort of expect people to get to poetry now is to start young and the younger the better. Um, and to uh, take classes, to you know, go to university, to get a BFA, to get an MFA, to be published in the right journals, to be on the under 30 lists, right, to receive these awards. I, I think I took one uh, creative writing class as an undergraduate, and it was one of those, you know, three weeks on poetry, three weeks on fiction, three weeks, and I really liked it. Um, but it didn't, it wasn't something that I started doing then. And I didn't really start writing until I was in my 30s after I had um, uh, finished my uh, uh, doctoral degree and was really uh, teaching. And I started, I moved to Durham, North Carolina, and I started going to a series in Raleigh called Stammer, which was a really community oriented series where there were performance poets and, you know, uh, sort of all kind of everything. And that's when I really started writing and started sort of, uh, you know, really working on uh, being a poet. And I don't have an MFA. I never went back to school uh, for it. I, you know, have maybe not uh, followed the most traditional path there, but it's been a path that's really worked for me. And I think it's really, I think one of the challenges that poetry has, and one of the things that I was really excited about being part of this series is that the, the people really like poetry and they, believe in the importance of poetry. We can see that with um, uh, Amanda Gorman at, you know, she somehow managed in a series of weeks, right, to be both at the inauguration and in the Super Bowl. Um, this is a not a typical poetry Amazing. story either. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that tells us how important poetry is, right? People know that poetry has real work to do for them, to help them think about themselves, to help them think about their times, maybe to see those things reflected, but also maybe to lay out new paths or new visions. Um, so I always want to take advantage of any time. I, you know, I'm always happy to show up at a university or a class and read, um, but any time I can go um, to a place that's not at a university and um, has a, a sort of a wider variety of audience. I'm really um, happy to do that because I think, you know, we need poet academics, but we also need poet astronauts and poet clergy and poet coal miners and incarcerated poets, right? We need all these things. Um, and so I thought maybe I would um, start tonight by uh, reading uh, some poems to you that are about uh, journeys. Um, but also I think are pretty good uh, examples of the types of questions that uh, you were asking, like, you know, in my journey, what kind of 
questions did I want uh, poetry to, to think about for me. So I'm gonna read a couple um, from uh, my first uh, book, Boyishly. And Boyishly really tries to think about what does masculinity look like when it's not in a traditional masculine form or body. So I'm going to read uh, two poems uh, from you. And so one way it does that is it tries to think about examples of sort of non-traditional masculinities. Um, and so the two that I've chosen uh, for, uh, for tonight um, are tell sort of two stories. Uh, one of Jonah, the Jonah who gets swallowed by the whale, and uh, Matt Talbot, who uh, if you've ever gone to Dublin, you may have crossed from the north side of Dublin to the south side of Dublin on the Matt Talbot Bridge. Um, he was a, a sort of great Irish, um, uh, almost sort of secular saint, um, and uh, still kind of has a prominent place there. So I'm going to read two pieces to start, uh, one uh, about Jonah and one about, about Matt Talbot. Notes from Jonah's lecture series. Inside the whale, it is as if you have always been inside a whale, as if there is only inside the whale. It is as if there was before the whale and now, and in now you will always be inside a whale. Inside the whale, you do not understand why you are inside a whale. It is even difficult to determine it is a whale. You may recall the sea and the ship and going over the side, but the whale you never saw. Question, what is the hardest angle for identifying whales? Answer, from inside the whale. From inside the whale, you cannot guide the whale. A whale will do as a whale will do. You may throw your body to one side or another to try to steer the whale. You may attempt to use the power of your mind to influence the whale. Your mind is of a greater capacity than the whale's mind, but again, a whale will do what a whale will do. When inside the whale, it is best to be inside the whale. Do what you are inside the whale to do. Of course, you may use only what was with you when thrown overboard. No one packs to go inside the whale. However, you should not try to agitate the whale. It doesn't help if the whale ejects you too far from shore. Unfortunately, you have forgotten about shore and think there is only inside the whale. When you find yourself inside a whale, meditate and practice journeys to outside the whale. Know these are skills that must be rehearsed before needed. Hear the pitch in his, ten in his tenuous rumble, taste the acid of his gentle lurp. Consider the feel of baleen brushing against skin and the way his rough tongue reopens your atrophied, unremembered eyes. Hmm. I, I, I gotta say, can I just? Yeah, yes, you can. You can stop. It, yeah. I know it's brilliant. I just I love that part when you said uh, uh, nobody packs to be inside a whale. <laughs> I just I had to laugh a little bit because it's it's funny the way you said it, but it's also true that we don't know where we're going to expect. We can't we can't figure out where we're going to be before until we get there, and then you have that moment in the middle or towards the end where you say, the person has forgotten what the shore is. And I, I love that, that, you know, you, you end it by having them trust in that meditative moment just to figure out, well, all right, this is where I am now. So what am I going to do here? And how yeah. am I? Yeah, it's a great story, right? To, to think about that sort of uh, trust and faith and, and being carried forward. So, yeah. You can take you, a... What's it like when people ask you questions about your poetry? Like, are, do you get shy or modest or how are how are you when people ask you? You know, in some ways, I think the poet is like the worst person to ask about um, a poem because <laughs> oftentimes like things happen in there that I don't know, you don't, um, you, you certainly like haven't planned for or you didn't, um, you know, it's not like uh, building a, a house or a, a Lego structure, right? Where you kind of have to know what everything's going to do. There are, there are great surprises for poets too, right? And that's the nice part of getting to talk about your poetry or having uh, people ask you about it because, yeah, there's a lot of things that happen that um, I don't necessarily notice or um, 
plan on either. So that's always nice. Mm -hmm. I always learn something about my poems and in, uh, in talking about them too. So cool. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's a nice part with it. All right. Can you take us over the bridge? Yeah. Uh, the next poem is called Slave to the Virgin. Matt Talbot walked Dublin with crushed glass in his socks, with barbed wire around his chest. Chains wrapped his right arm and knee, cords the other side. Hid these bindings beneath his clothes, crossed the city's river moving from mass to mass this way because he found himself a slave to the virgin. He carried bricks for a living, made alms of what he earned, slept only on a plank, kept but a timber for his pillow, never swore, took the pledge, no tobacco, told no one how he lived, for pride and devotion he thought the most devious sin of them all. Bound his body to learn his body, learned his body to forget his body. How else to get to empty, how else to reach freedom but by journey, back and forth across the waters beneath the monkey puzzle trees, walked quickly, head down. How else to approach her but with a tested heart made tomb? A slave, am I? My body a coffle, chained in one world, driven to the next. There's mornings I think of heaving me over the bridge, nights I dream I cross the river north to hide myself from myself, to keep me off my trail. But there's no smarts in that. This river runs a knife that guts the city's middle. These monkeys cross it daily, forever looking down. Amant I a slave to the virgin? Amant I a hod carrier for the Lord? Hmm. You know, now you got me thinking, because I remember you prefaced these two poems saying that these were explorations and what masculinity looks like in different bodies. And I'd forgotten that part. I got so wrapped up in the imagery of the whale. And now I'm thinking about it again. And also with this one, slave to the virgin. That's compelling. I don't know who Matt Talbot is, so I'm a little bit of a deficit there. Can you can you reveal who Matt Talbot is? Yeah, he was uh, simply a, a, a guy in Dublin who was kind of, you know, um, known for um, his um, his devotion, his continually showing up at masses. He would kind of go, you know, uh, from mass to mass across the city. Um, and he uh, lived, you know, in the simplest of ways. And it, you know, it wasn't until after he died that people found out that, you know, he was giving all his money to the church and that he wore these kind of mortification things uh, underneath his uh, clothes uh, the whole time because he, you know, found this his sort of uh, most effective way to kind of, you know, uh, remind himself of, of who he was and and where he saw himself being so he's you know he's kind of a there is a Matt Talbot bridge they named a bridge uh, after him um and he's you know he, I guess probably maybe more people know him for the bridge than anything else but um um you know he's kind of a a, a great Dublin character a great Irish right. character and you said in the in the middle of that verse somewhere that he was trying to learn his body did I remember that right yeah, I think the line is right. He he was trying to learn his body to forget his body, right? To, yes, learn his body to forget his body. That's compelling. How does that work? <laughs> well, the Matt <laughs> Matt Talbot may uh, speak to its uh, its uh, abilities or it's not, but right. I mean, you think about this kind of like this was kind of one of the the great things after he died that uh, this is when people discovered the sort of extreme kind of mortification uh, attempts that he'd taken throughout his life. He did kind of, you know, he wore, he walked around Dublin with crushed glass in his, his shoes and, you know, had these bindings of wire and that he continually wore underneath them. And so, yeah, I was trying to think about like, right, why, why do you do this? Well, one way to go beyond the body, right, is to, to know it from the inside out right is to know it so well that you can transcend it to go beyond so yes yeah and i'm i'm returning back to the the, the poem about jonah i'm wondering if that character goes through a similar process is that um, analogically or metaphorically what what's going on it, it, towards the end of that poem he's learning just to kind of uh feel the tongue of the whale understand exactly where he is as learning the body isn't it 
Yeah, right. A kind of being where you are, at least, right, as a way of transcendence of, of yeah, being in, the, in your moment, being in your place. And that one also had that line earlier that I, I, I liked, uh, nobody packs to be inside a whale. There's no preparation for this journey. You just have to, you have to own the moment or it just, I guess it goes away. Yeah, well, right. Well, this is one thing we all learned last year around this time is that all of a sudden you may find yourself in a journey at, the, at a time where you did not necessarily expect to be in one, right? No, we did not, we did not pack to go uh, to enter COVID, but here we were, right? Absolutely. And we all found our way through as best we could, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, wow. Okay. Um, you mentioned. Um, I have your... a question. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, Charlie. Um, my questions are a little bit more like practical nuts and bolts. Sure. Um, and if that's okay, I'm, I'm going to kind of throw those in there because I think people are curious about poetry and and what is it you mentioned earlier in your intro that poetry is important? Um, why? I mean, you just reading those two poems, at the very beginning, you had me with these visual images um, of carrying bricks and being in a whale. But why, can you put into words kind of quickly why, poet, why you think poetry is important? Well, I mean, I guess to me, like uh, for me personally, the the poetry that's important to me is poetry. It might be poetry where I see myself, right, or I see my story. That and that reflection uh, is becomes meaningful to know that you know others see me or others you know live and uh, ask similar questions. So I think sometimes it's reflection where you see yourself or you see your situation. But other times, I think uh, a great advantage poetry has, and the thing that I'm interested in as a poet, is that you can also, is that a poss that possibility of imagination, right? You don't just have to write what is real and, and, and true. You can also imagine greater things. You're not held by things that have actually happened. You're not held by, um, you know, kind of world building in the way that like nonfiction or fiction is, right? Poetry can exist outside of all those things. I, you know, uh, I, for a while, I, I sometimes write about science, but I always say, don't try to learn science from my poems. Or sometimes I have history in my poems, but don't try to learn history from my poems because as a poet, I don't, I don't feel obligated to, to be actual. In fact, I feel obligated to to present a different kind of world, maybe a world that lives under this world or maybe an alternative world, right? Um, and so mm -hmm. uh, that's that, that to me is the great advantage of poetry is that, and that can be very important, right? To see a different way to, to be or to get somewhere or to speak or to see yourself. Um, and so those, those alternative uh, worlds I think are really super important too. Awesome. Only the imagination is real. <laughs> Albert Einstein. <laughs> There's a truth to that, yes. <laughs> um, well, let me, uh, I'm going to read you uh, a couple poems uh, that think about journeys to from uh, my second book, uh, which is called Stay. And Stay really tries to think about what does it cost to stay in an idea or an identity or a geographical place? Or what does it cost to leave that same thing, right? There's costs either way to stay or to go. And so it tries to think about uh, both of those things. Uh, so the first poem I'm gonna read is called Zeno's Boat. On tumorous claws rats boarded the ship. They left their mothers behind. That glossy hawk kept tethered to deck, he left his mother behind. Clinging fleas, dirt, and mite showed resilience, leaving mothers behind. Viruses persevered in the blood and left their mothers behind. But mothers never forgive departures, a leaving is an arrow to your poor mother's heart. Mothers' hearts hold their young the way young boys hold birds, by a string kept in hand, with the string looped in knot. And children never forget the holding, the strength in mother's grip comes from fine-tuning bows. 
underfoot calloused rats gnaw through a box as they eat what we carefully stored. From the mass we have spotted the inland pines, but no, we will never arrive. They are deep indigenous giants. We know we shall never arrive. We pray one day those towers might fall and no, we will never arrive. Miles to yards to feet to inches, yet we know we can never arrive. Bartholomew, the cobbler's son, leads the group through Vespers tonight. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them like snow, and ashore wave the longleaf pines. Behind us bob a string of days, linking stay to go, while below in the hold rats swim through bilge like they swam round their own mother's bellies. And then uh, the second piece I'm going to read is called Nothing Left to Burn Down Here. One winter there struck a terrible storm. Snow, then ice, snow, then ice, over and over again. Wind blew drifts, cold froze them hard. Layers that made everything impossible. No getting out, nothing to get in. The mother explained the shortage of fuel oil, how they would live in one room together, hang blankets in the doorway to keep in the heat, eat soup and porridge for meals. The girl thought they should start a fire, made a list of what they could bust up, burn, the kitchen table, dining room chairs, a shifferobe, that word from a library book. How would they return library books until a thaw, a break, the mother said no one had to bathe. Everyone still brushed teeth. The fifth day, the father heated blankets and bricks in the oven, pressed the blankets to a second floor window until it thawed enough to open, duct taped two of the bricks to his belly, zipped coveralls over it all, slid out the window, down the drift, dug out the side door, turned around, tunneled into the snow, made a room, deep enough to crawl into, tall enough to sit, for you girls to play in, fresh air. It was better that way, inside but out, gave them a lantern to see by, nothing you could burn down here. The walls grew shiny as they melted and froze, melted and froze again. The girls read books, played TV show, Charlie's Angels, the one where Kelly gets shot in the head by the sweet, simple boy who does not understand what a gun is, can do. How beautiful she looks in the hospital bed, the part where she wakes up, forgives him. Little House on the Prairie, the one where they tie Paw to the fence, afraid a raccoon may have given him rabies. How they do not want to do it, how Paw says it is what they must do. Before sleep that night, the sister asked, do you think that we could do it? Zipped into sleeping bags, buried under blankets, ovened bricks against their feet, tops of their heads just touching together. Do you really think we could? Before the roads would open again, before the fuel oil would make it through, before the father would leave and return, leave and return again, they slept in their day clothes, ate off their laps, washed only hands, talked only to each other, breathed in the other's breath a million times, then a million times again, swore they would always live together, just like this, in this house, when they were old, older, until the day they died. The girls would live much longer than they imagined, but never again like that, tunneled in a den, matted, feral, warm. Did you think that we could do it? I did not think we could. Wow, Tanya, that's compelling. Um, the title of the collection is Stay. And, yes. And the characters really want to go. Yeah, there's a lot of staying and going, right? It was, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, you know, we were sort of uh, talking about the questions that uh, people think about, or, you know, like, what are the questions that I wanted poetry to, to help me with and, you know, hopefully other people was, and that was, you know, my question of the moment, like, what does it cost to leave a place? What does it cost to stay in a place, you know? And uh, yeah, so, and there's a lot of ways to think about that, right? A lot of uh, real and imagined ways to do that. Yeah, I was struck by the, re the, the refrain in the first poem, we know we can never arrive. Um, 
And I, I lost track because there were rats in that poem. <laughs> there are rats, but, yes. <laughs> is that the rats thinking we can never write? Or was it the other characters or maybe both? Because I, I forgot. Yeah, I think mostly I sort of think about that as the the people on the boat, right? The the uh, Zeno, so the poem is called Zeno's Boat, right? And there's the paradox of Zeno's arrow, how if Zeno shoots an arrow and every second or whatever, right, it gets halfway to the 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 target, yeah. how it will never reach there, right? Because it only goes halfway every time. This is a philosophical conundrum. So yeah, right. This sort of same idea of like, uh, yeah, well, you could be leave you could be on a ship, or you could be um, hunkered down in a home in a dangerous situation, and every little struggle, every little moment that you put into that effort to improve things, is never going to solve things. Yeah, right. And there is that, that great question of arrival, right? When do you when do you arrive? When do you get there? You know. And yeah, how do you know? And what and language, how do you know? Yeah. What language you use to name that? That's that's compelling. Yeah. I've got a question from the from the people. All right. Uh, so Tanya, Tanya, I stalked you a little bit on um, on the internet, and I I noticed that I I watched a lot of your reading, and um, th th you're really funny. Most people think that poetry is just like this super intense thing. So um, this person asks a question about uh, spoken poetry. She says, uh, spoken poetry brings levels of exciting dynamism for me more than the pace and voice I assign in my own reading. Can you describe the significance or difference of performing uh, your verses? Yeah, I think there was when I when I first started uh, when I first got really interested in poetry and in writing, it came from sort of performance poets. So not exactly spoken word poets, right? But people who were really sort of performing on stage, um, and so that was my first um, attraction uh, to it. I now I I now say that I live more on the page than I do in the on the stage. Um, so I try to think about poems that are going to work on the page. But in every book, there's always a few poems that I end up um, sort of memorizing and performing more because they work better that way. Um, for any variety of reasons. So I try to think that, you know, that they have to live in both of those worlds, that ultimately probably what's going to happen is somebody's going to buy this book or see a poem somewhere and they're going to read it and they have to be able to navigate it and, you know, pull things out of it. And yet, uh, you know, I, I love a poem that um, exists in performance, you know, that gains something in performance. So I, I try to keep a foot in both of those worlds, um, but probably it's maybe like 70, 30 of, you know, page to stage more. But I think about mm -hmm. both of those things. And reading a poem aloud is always a very important part of the process for me, even if it's just a page poem. I always try to think about a poem being shared with a, 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 an audience. Mm, interesting. Yeah, because it's hard to know how to hear, hear it, you know. And But then now that I've heard you, I... I can imagine your your voice and your your rhythm and yeah. your your tempo and and all of that. Yeah, and it's hard because I don't want uh, I don't want a reader to have to have heard my voice or to have heard me read a poem to be able to find their way through it. But I also um, I want when they do hear me read it, I do I want that to be um, a meaningful thing too, even if it's different from their own. Right, that's mm -hmm. okay. Hmm. So Tanya, you have you have started the journey with us. We've gone over a bridge, <laughs> uh, gone on a boat. <laughs> and I know that and we've been all, in a whale. We've been in a whale. <laughs> whale. And all of those things, that's the journey starting. But um, in your work and in, in your qu the questions you've been asking as a poet overall, we know that the journey doesn't always uh, um, uh, end where you think it's going to end. And kind of like the last poem, it's arrival could be 
could be never ending. So could you talk to us a little bit more through your poetry, especially about what it's like to encounter a surprise along the way in the journey and how do you how do you handle that i'm sure yeah. some of your poems illustrate that yeah i mean it's look i am happy anytime a poem wants to show up fully formed and ready to roll and jump itself onto the page i am i will welcome that um but that's usually not what happens right um and so i think that's where a poem starts and where a poem ends are usually two really different things. And I think it's not always very helpful to have a plan for a poem. I'm a very regimented person. I like a schedule, I like order, I like routine. Um, and so I always am kind of surprised that I'm a poet because poetry um, for me takes a lot of just uh, having faith and following an idea around until it reveals itself. Um, and so I'm not a daily writer. I don't sit down at the same time every day. I know sometimes people say, right, this is an important part of their process and that's great. Um, uh, but for me, that doesn't really work. I will say I'm a daily thinker about poetry. And so I often sort of pose um, uh, maybe a specific problem or question like this line, is it working? How can I fix it? Or this week I've been trying to think about, I'm working on a new poem that has a kind of uh, framing structure around it and uh, that frame isn't working. So I've been trying to think about that frame. So I may not sit down and like, you know, work that problem out, but I do like to like put that problem in my brain and let my brain deal with that and unpack it while I'm doing all kinds of other things. And so in order to do that, that kind of means that you just have to like follow your thinking around or follow the problem around and be sure to have a pen and paper to write it down when you do figure it out, right? So I think that's great. Like it, it means that you have to make space for surprises. You can't tell the poem what you want it to do. You just have to let the poem do what it's going to and kind of follow it around. Um, so I thought I'd read uh, a few poems that uh, for me uh, had uh, surprises um, uh, in them. And um, the first one uh, is a poem called My Love is Green, America. And I really, uh, one of the things I really love about poetry, I, I really like as a writer is I love people's stories and I love people's voices. And so I often have like a little bit of a story or a voice that I'm kind of carrying with me that I'm trying to find the right space for or I'm trying to find the right home for. And this poem came out of, um, uh, morning edition on Friday, I guess it probably still does, had this thing called StoryCorps that maybe uh, some of you are, or, where they just record people's stories, right? And they play them at the end and they always make me weep copiously yes. um, and, they're, and they're touching <laughs> and moving. And this one guy was on one morning, I was driving to work and he was talking about, I think he and his partner had maybe like just gotten married or something. I can't exactly remember. But he was talking about how he felt like for most of his life he was going around and he was going to have this big well of love in him that he was never going to be able to give to anyone else and how devastating that was to him. And of course, I cried and cried and cried because it's, you know, it makes me cry now to think about it. But I knew like I wanted to, I love that idea of like having this well of love inside you that couldn't be tapped and that you couldn't share. And this would be the tragedy that you would die with all of this inside you. Well, I, I knew that's what I wanted to write about. And I tried like 18,000 ways. And I wrote this down when I was taking notes for tonight's reading. And I was like, why did I ever think that was going to work? I started the first way I tried to write this was a poem about a coal miner on a blind date. See, you, I just said it and you knew that's not gonna work, Tanya. That's a terrible idea for a poem. But I tried it and it wouldn't work. And so I tried it then kind of getting in the first person of it. It had been in third person and that was a little better, but not much better. And I tried and tried and tried with this poem. And I can't remember how exactly, but eventually I got to the idea that this guy was like giving this as like a speech in a kind of inappropriate way at an inappropriate time, right? When you just are so moved or angered or 
you know, something so important that you just kind of blurt it out at somebody in a time that's probably not the right time to do that. And somehow that, I, I had all this context for that in the poem and that was all terrible. So I ended up like stripping all of that out. So this was a poem that went through a lot, a lot, a lot of um, uh, work and versions to finally get to the version where it is that I think it actually works in. And so it's called My Love is Green America. You can die with a giant wad of love jamming up your heart, your heart a mine shaft stuffed full of subbituminous coal no one thinks worth taking. Everyone else can find a miner to scuttle out their veins. Everyone else has a miner who shows up for work daily and chops and blasts and digs and hauls. And there is runoff and poisoned water occasionally, but that is just the cost of change in America. Decapitated mountains are the price we are willing to pay for love in America. But no one, no one has ever been adversely affected by a shaft collapse or pitching seams in my heart. No one has died or become trapped there. There is no need to send down a canary because I am green. My love is green, America. It is sustainable. It burns clean. It has its own czar and a series of commercials urging you to adopt it as a lifestyle. It has a marketing team constructing eye-catching symbols, which you too can attach to your packaging to make you more attractive because whether they ever act on it or not, when asked, American consumers express an interest in purchasing green products, but a sad, true fact is they may be lying. They may only be stating what they wish could be true, imagining a person they wish they could be, an American who consumes green products, but in real life, they may not even be bothered to keep a bin or compost or recycle. And here's one other sad, true ecological fact. Some things of the earth remain in the earth. They live and die in the earth. And those things of the earth just lie in the earth knowing that only inches keep them from experiences like bird and soft and weather. And those things of the earth just lie in the earth hoping one day they will be something other than of the earth. But a sad true ecological fact is you can die having never left a grave of earth. And the sad true ecological fact is if you die from your heart being jammed full of love, your heart will still be making more love right up to the second you die. It is just a fact. You can die with a giant wad of love jamming up your heart. Hmm. Wow. I I'm going to refrain myself from commenting because I know you have other poems you want to read and I just, but can I just say, wow, that's, <laughs> that's such a beautiful image. And I think you solved the problem at the end. Love. Yeah. Love, love yeah. I liked where it eventually got uh, yeah, with too. it too. I had, a, I think oftentimes as poets, you kind of carry around those little things. Like I had, you know, this, this guy's story core um, story. And for a long time, uh, I this uh, the next poem I'm gonna read is called Other People Call It America. And you may notice I use the word America in poems a lot. Um, that's because I, um, I think of myself as an American poet and I like to tackle American questions. I like to talk to America. I like to talk about America. So it often kinds of in, often ends its way up in, uh, in my poems. But one of my favorite American moments, one of my favorite Americans, one of my favorite American speeches is uh, when Fannie Lou Hamer um, uh, testified before the, uh, the Democratic uh, Credentials Committee in 1964 to argue that the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party should be seated um, at the Democratic National Convention. And so like I knew, I love that, I love the speech, I love the, uh, I love Fannie Lou Hamer, and I love the visual of um, her with uh, her big, I'm just gonna call it a big grandma purse, right, that she carries into the testimony and puts up on the, the table. And I knew I wanted to write about that moment, but I just, I didn't know how or why or when. And so I carried that with me for a long time. And then I read a, 
a review of a book about Aretha Franklin that talked about Aretha Franklin, right? If you see her, when if you saw her perform, she often also had a big purse that she would put up on her piano or have out on stage with her. And it talked about how um, she uh, very quickly realized as a, a black woman that uh, she was gonna get ripped off in the music industry a lot. And so she very early on, uh, when she would go to do a concert, she would demand to be paid in cash before she performed. And she would take all that cash and stick it in her purse and carry her purse out onto the stage with her so nobody could steal it from her. So I love those two American moments um, together. And so uh, I put them uh, into this poem called Other People Call It America. The Reverend C.L. Franklin rode that great migration right out of Sunflower County. Car then bus, bus then train, Memphis, Buffalo, Detroit. Told the word as God revealed it a fiery word of God, the building word of God. Let God's word build until it broke, wash over the heads of his little ones, Carl, Irma, Carolyn, Aretha, a wave that left them washed in the word, that wave left those children anointed. That same migration left the Townsends behind, rose up plenty, but the Townsend family stayed. All 20 children stayed, stayed to Sunflower County, stayed to sharecropping, stuck on Marlowe land, strong family, mighty children, each one pick a couple hundred pounds a day, every day, but Sunday, Sunday go to meeting day, Sunday for wearing the crown, Sunday all about the glory, meeting the place Fannie Lou met Pap. Aretha wanted to cross over, but not really leave, go, but take the gospel with her. Took a lot with her from the gospel, what a hat and fur say about a woman, why it's smart to get the cash up front, stash the cash in your purse, prop the purse up top the piano, where the purse can always be seen, wear a fur to show you conquered this world, drop the fur to show you can leave this world behind. Miss Hamer wished to speak true. Make the world say what it said, give up what it done, took her purse with her to testify for what was in it, for what it said about her, said, my name is Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, said, I live at 626 East Lafayette Street, Ruleville, Mississippi, said, I question America, said, 16 bullets was fired into the home for me, said, our lives be threatened daily. Purse, say Sunflower County, Miss Hamer said, is this America? Miss Hamer spoke this to America. There was only three channels back then, so everybody heard it. Only three channels then, so everybody watched the same thing. Everybody watch it mean everybody talk about it. Miss Hamer put her purse up top the table, sat herself behind it, said these things to America. Everybody, even the president, heard her. Miss Hamer and her purse scare the president so bad, he took her right off the TV. Miss Franklin sang the first black president into the White House, wore her coat, wore her hat, sang him right in the front door. Hat like a big tied bow. People lined up all down the mall, set her purse on the chair, watched that for me, stood up to sing, hand on her heart. And where my father died, she sang, let freedom ring, she sang, let it ring, she sang, let it ring. My country tis of thee, this song is called. Other people call it America. That's progress, right? Something like it, ever north, ever north. R.E.S. Detroit, all gutted buildings. R.E.S. Flint to wash and leaded children. Detroit, one building aflame, catch up the next. Flint, a city left dry at its bones. Miss Hamer, buried in Ruleville now. Easy walk, graveside to home. Made her house a daycare. I'm sick and tired, the headstones say, of being sick and tired. Miss Franklin sang the other day at the Kennedy Center. Wore fur out onto the stage, put her purse up top the piano, sat herself down to play. Background singers say, I oop, president set to crying. Background singers, I oop again, honored white lady proceed to lose her mind. Miss Franklin stand herself up. Miss Franklin walk away from that piano. Man come out behind her. Mr. Man gonna finish playing this song. You make me feel, she sang and drop her fur to the floor. You make me feel, she sang with her arm rose up in the air. You make me feel, she sang. You make me feel. So much love. It's so, it's, there's so much love in that. I love it. I, 
I, and I remember those moments too. I remember I, I've watched that moment of of, uh, of Aretha singing for for Barack like five times, and I cry every time. Yeah, the reasons you say, like she takes off the cuff for those reasons, the purse. Yeah, it's compelling. Yeah, those are uh, those are all very um, to me very um, strong, compelling uh, American moments that I think are. Well, I like the way you combine them. It's the uh, Fannie Lou Hamer's love for justice, um, and and uh, Aretha's love for her music and 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 her her gift of uh, of just empowering people with that voice. Is I like the way you put them together. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Charlie. You looked like you were going to ask me something. Well, I've got a question. Um, sure. Uh, for me, uh, the the priest, <laughs> and then I've got a question from the from the floor there. Um, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of talk around spiritual, but not religious, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and definitely, I think all poetry, you know, captures a spirit, a spiritual nuance of, you know, um, that otherness that you were talking about earlier. Um, but yours captures a kind of a, a nostalgic religiosity also, um, and I just wonder if you could say a little bit about the role of religion in your life or not, or the role of religion in your art or not. Yeah, I, I grew up in the South, uh, which I think kind of uh, means I grew up in Georgia. So I think that, and you know, I, I, I as a, teenager I guess you know we would uh, attend a Methodist church it was never a very central part of my life but I do feel like between being an American being a southerner and you know having uh, you know some uh, religious practice from my youth that I have a lot of um, uh, surface level uh, biblical knowledge, you know, the story of Jonah and the whale or, you know, um, these mm -hmm. kinds of things. But I do feel like, I mean, I think you're right that like poetry and, uh, and religion are, are not unconnected things because, right, they do both recognize the presence of something bigger, right? That there is something that is um, larger than than uh, we as individuals, right? And for poets, right, you try to, that might be about seeing bigger connections or it might be about, you know, making something simple, more profound, but it, whatever it is, right? It is about this kind of like, not thinking that you are the, the, the biggest thing, seeing other larger things than yourself. I think that's, you know, I think that's a, a to me, a, a great connection between those two things. Yeah, and poetry, uh, you know, the definition of poetry that I've always liked is poetry helps us see things differently. Absolutely, yeah. And helps us experience things differently um, in a more different way. I mean, yeah. And I deeper, right? Always, can can yeah, help deeper. you feel deeper too, I think, is a, is, a, is a great connection there, so. All right, we're about, we've got a few more minutes, but um, Dave, if it's okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come, try to combine two questions from our viewers. Um, the, the first question is about your, um, what poets influenced you mm. early, like what poets kind of launched you. And then this other uh, person asks, uh, she says that she's just beginning to write poetry again. Uh oh, did we lose Charlie? I happen to have read that question and it oh, was, good. oh, he's back, okay. Oh, good. We only got the first half of the second did, did question, I, did I, Charlie. Yeah, you froze up there for the last yeah. one. Okay, sorry. Uh, the, the, first, the first piece is what are the early influences for you? And then as, as a person just beginning to write poetry again, this one uh, person asks, what do you feel is the most important thing to know? Mm. Well, the poets that influence me, um, I, when I, when I had my uh, first book, uh, Boyishly, I will just confess that the, the practice of poetry blurbing where poets 
write blurbs for other poets books is like to me like one of the grossest parts of poetry you know <laughs> like every single one of themselves if you only read one book of poetry this year it must be this one <laughs> and usually that means that like that was a student of theirs or this was a friend of theirs you know yeah. um and so i was like <laughs> I was like, I'm not doing poetry blurbs. And my publisher was much more um, uh, practical and was like, well, you are going to do some poetry blurbs, but we can do them in different ways. And what I want you to think about is who do you, how can we use blurbs to put you in your poetry family, right? How can we use those to help? Because no one's going to have heard of you. And uh, how are they going to know who you are as a poet. And so that I could kind of get behind. I was like, okay, I'll help, I'll use these blurbs to help me position myself and my poetry family. Um, and so the people that I asked uh, and who I did not know and they graciously uh, agreed to uh, was a poet named C.A. Conrad, who's a, who was a Philadelphia based poet. I don't know where he is now, um, but he is a great He's one of the most interesting American poets writing now. I think he's very much now into kind of like the um, poetry experiments. Um, and yeah, I would just say, read him, uh, Google him. He's very easy. And then uh, a New York poet named uh, uh, Dottie Lasky, Dorothea Lasky, whose work I just think is uh, super fabulous. Um, and so those were two poets that made it possible for me to think if they can make it in poetry, I can make it in poetry, right? If they have found a path, then I can found a, I can find a path. Um, and so they were very important. But I also like, you know, I, uh, I do a lot of work in Irish literature. And so certainly people um, like um, uh, Yeats and um, um, uh, uh, Patrick Kavanaugh and, uh, Evan Boland were all really important uh, poets. Lucille Clifton is a really important poet now, right? Somebody who can just write the, the daily and make it really mm -hmm. beautiful. So I think that, and I guess I would relate that to the my second answer, which, yeah, you know, there's the thing that you have to do to be a good poet is to be a good reader, right? You have to read a lot of poetry and you have to kind of think about what what is that poetry doing, right? I mean, I all the time I'm reading people and I think like, I want to do what they did there, right? I want to use repetition the way they use repetition there, or I like the way they use line break. So I think you have to be a really good reader and you have to be a good tinkerer then, right? Pull those poems apart and see how they're working and see what you're going to steal from them and sort of incorporate into your own work. Um, mm -hmm. So read, find a community of poets. And, awesome. Yeah. Dave, do you have, uh, do you have uh, one more question you'd like to ask? Well, I, I know we're, we're rounding out our time. So maybe uh, Tanya, I can just kind of ask you to reflect on where you are now in, in your journey. And uh, if, if there's maybe one final poem you would like to share with us to kind of, sh you know, give us a sense of what you're doing now. Yeah, I'm, I am working on a new book. It's very um, uh, early and I, um, it's, I started thinking a lot about, it started by thinking a lot about uh, the radio and country music were the two things that I was reading and thinking a lot about. Um, that sort of morphed into me thinking a lot about my parents, not in a sort of uh, nostalgic way. Um, uh, neither of my parents are living. And of course I would uh, love for either of them to, uh, both of them to still be living, but it's not a kind of like nostalgia. I want to go back. I do not want to like go back to 40 or 30 or 20 or any of those things. Um, but, or seeing those times is better, but a way of trying to like use thinking about them as a way to stitch an understanding of myself where I am now. Um, this has left me. <laughs> so I've written a lot of really long poems about m me or my parents, and which has left me with the question of who in the world would want to read these poems, these really long <laughs> poems about me and my parents. Um, poems are supposed to be short, Tanya. I know, short and not <laughs> just about you. It would be a great thing. Um, but so I'm actually, I have one that's kind of ready to read, but I'm not going to read because it's actually kind of long. And I know we're at our end um, of our time with that. But um, yeah, so I'm working on a new book and it's in its very early stages, I would say that. And, and Zeno's paradox that, that 
you never arrive. Would you say you you have not arrived and never will arrive? Yeah, no. I mean, right? When do you ever get done being a poet, right? You just and really, I mean, like I I can't imagine a time when I would not write poetry. It's the it's like the only thing I know how to write, um, and uh, it's I don't know. It's super important to me, right? I I, I feel like a great advantage I have because you know I I don't. My, t my work in a university is not connected to my poetry. I feel like that just gives me the, the, the only person I ever have to please with my poetry is myself. But the good thing is, right, I get to keep making myself happy with my poetry. So yeah, I can only imagine that that will keep on going. Well, I, I imagine that like the characters in a lot of your poems, uh, you're very active in figuring out how to be happy. And in, in sense, and what I mean by that is, is the knowledge for self-development not mm -hmm. not a pleasure but but to really be inquiring where you need to be and yeah I, I i doubt you'll ever stop doing that just yeah from the, the way you write yeah yeah i'll at least stop. i don't know about the knowledge part whether that part works but the question asking that definitely works so yeah and you tell tell people where they can find your poetry um, I have, I think we have a link that we can uh, put in the chat, uh, boyishly is almost um, out of uh, print. It's almost sold out of its uh, print. I think there are a, maybe a few copies still left on Amazon, but uh, the, that one is running out. Um, but uh, Stay is available from uh, Yes Yes Books or is available on Amazon if that is how you choose to buy your books um, or is available at your favorite bookstore once it's finally ever open again. <laughs> Great. Chop, and chop we put yeah. we put information in, in the uh, chat as well. Great. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Tanya, thank you. Um, you, uh, you know, the, the reason we are bringing artists together for this series is to help us open open up a new way of being and seeing things more deeply. And uh, you've done that this week. Hamilton Glass did it uh, last week. And uh, next week, we're going to have Spencer Reese, uh, who is a poet. He is a um, he's an Episcopal priest and he's a painter. So uh, next week, everyone, please join us uh, same time, seven o'clock on Thursdays uh, for Spencer Reese. Um, Dave, thank you, as usual, for your uh, insightful questions. Um, and just uh, one note here is if you'd like uh, to learn more about uh, St. Paul's, you can go to stpaulsrva.org. And also, if you're interested in pre-ordering your uh, Lenten lunch for the Lenten lunch menu, uh, you need to place that order by Wednesday. And information is on the website about that. Um, okay, folks. Well, we look forward to uh, being uh, with you all again next week. Until then, uh, may you be blessed and may you be a blessing to others. Have a beautiful weekend. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Joe.
All right, folks. Um, Sarah, are you there still? Yes. I am just working on something. Okay. Sorry. Okay, I had to individually remove a <laughs> person who wouldn't leave. Um. That's how in my class, you know, they've signed on to class and then disappeared, right? They've, yeah. they've gone off to do something entirely different. <laughs> and then the class ends and they're still there. They're yep. still there. Oh my they're God. There. Or are they? Or are <laughs> teacher's pet? <laughs> well, thank you all very much. That was a lot of fun. It was really nice to...